They warned us that this was coming. Now it is here. Artificial intelligence has unleashed terror in the killing fields of Gaza. Germany stands accused of complicity in Israel's genocide. That has hit a nerve in Berlin. Plus, investigative journalists in Ukraine digging into state corruption, the dangers that come with that. For six months now, the world has watched as Israeli bombs have fallen on Gaza in a war that has killed more than 33,000 Palestinians. Another 10,000 remain unaccounted for, presumably dead beneath the rubble. The level of destruction is utterly inhumane, which, given the role that artificial intelligence has played in this war, is no accident. According to an investigation by two Israeli news outlets, the military there has been using an AI program called Lavender to identify its targets. The revelations about how the AI system makes those calls, the loss of innocent lives baked into the decision-making process, and how the killing actually takes place are all terrifying. Scarier still is the fact that this is technology that can travel. So the implications of this story extend well beyond the Gaza Strip. This is a war that six months in still manages through our phones and our feeds to horrify us daily. In the number of innocents killed, in the way they are killed, Palestinians urged by the Israelis to go to safe spaces that are then bombed. Civilians shot to death in hospitals or when lining up for food, starved to death while the world watches. And when the Israeli military uses artificial intelligence, an AI-based targeting system codenamed Lavender, as a weapon of war, among the casualties, the collateral damage is our collective humanity. Lavender appears to be a glorified AI washed kill list. Effectively, it's a system that throws up names. And we see through the reporting on the Lavender system that soldiers, again, are being compelled to treat Palestinians as numbers. What that does is it removes the friction that exists normally between humans and the decision to kill. All these systems lend a kind of veneer of technical rationality to what essentially seems to be a mass killing campaign. It shows how the military strategy after October 7th was dictated lar largely by vengeance. And it just goes to show that the use of this technology was really just kind of a crutch to allow this killing campaign to go on. The Israeli military first deployed AI to select targets in 2021 in a war on Gaza that lasted 11 days. Two months after Hamas's attacks on October 7th, two Israeli news outlets, Plus 972 and Local Call, reported that the army had rolled out a more advanced, more destructive AI tool called the Gospel, able to increase the number of targets, buildings and structures from dozens a day to thousands. Then, just last week, those same two outlets combined to lift the lid on Lavender revealing that it takes that AI technology and uses it to target humans based on things like their social media, their contacts, movements, and how many times they change their SIM cards. Plus 972 and local calls say that they base their reporting on six sources, all from the Israeli military. What their story makes clear is that the taking of innocent Palestinian lives is not a flaw in the technology, it is a feature built in. This is a good example where AI has been misused uh, to, to worsening the situation for people on the ground. How it was used for mass killing Palestinians, how they accepted 90% of accuracy and the 10% were accepted as a margin error for targeting people to end up with over 33,000 people uh, have been killed in Gaza. And the only human review for the lavender system was just to check within seconds if the target is a male 
male or not, which basically dehumanizes Palestinian men as they are all allowed to be targeted. And this is exactly why we should be questioning such technologies and how they are used and weaponized against oppressed people. Lavender basically creates a bank of targets, people to be eliminated, and the system found 37,000 such targets. This resulted in Israel bombarding Gaza with a quantity of weapons that is almost unheard of in terms of the amount of TNT that was dropped there. Why? Because we have enough targets to drop a very large amount of explosives, because the system had decided that these people need to be killed. The algorithms actually make these kill decisions and they are loaded with probability and bias errors. Different from the errors in human decision making, but errors all the same. The most concerning part of these revelations was the over-reliance on AI systems. There was essentially a complete trust in who the, the system determined was a target. So instead of usually culling through surveillance data, deciding if somebody was actually Hamas operative, the army just signed off on thousands and thousands of targets to strike. It essentially confirms that almost everybody in Gaza seems to be considered a legitimate um, target by the Israeli military. There's also the way they target them and when. Plus 972 and local call also revealed, reportedly based on those same six sources in the Israeli army, the existence of another automated system called Where's Daddy? It is used to track targeted individuals to their homes. Then comes the inhuman element. Israeli military personnel delay their bombing until after dark, when there's a greater probability of the target being there along with their family, thereby driving up the civilian death toll. Suddenly, airstrikes started targeting their houses. While Israel is backed politically in this war by Washington, its army needs Silicon Valley technologically. The military's mass surveillance systems are reliant on Google Images to work. Google has a policy that dictates its products cannot be used to cause what the company calls immediate harm. Not only is the tech giant breaking its own rules by letting the Israeli military attack Palestinians with Google's help, when journalists at the New York Times, The Intercept, or The Listening Post ask the company to justify its inaction or even comment on it, it fails to respond. What Google ought to do and what other companies ought to do is to ensure that there are safeguards against uh, their usage, that they aren't giving access to use their systems in ways that could help scale up the kinds of unlawful acts that we're witnessing in Gaza. Simply saying that one is pro-human rights as a tech company is not really enough anymore. And really, big tech companies have to, have to do a lot more uh, to ensure that they aren't uh, knowingly or unknowingly contributing uh, to the situation in Gaza. The people at Google didn't necessarily realize they were creating software that would become the basis for one of the biggest surveillance systems humanity has ever seen. Some people in the army who saw these systems in action did something quite unusual and spoke about why it was so wrong. I've heard there are many people in the Israeli army who do not agree with how the war is being fought. Those who spoke up are perhaps the bravest Israelis in the war. Something broke within them and they decided that they would not cooperate any longer. <laughs> Israel has been honing its surveillance of Palestinians for years. The West Bank city of Hebron has been the primary laboratory, the testing ground for new surveillance tools. Palestinians in Gaza now find themselves in a dystopian nightmare, at the mercy of a military that can see their every move and can kill with apparent impunity. As damaging as the investigation by Plus 972, and local call may prove to be for Israeli leaders, the reality is this AI technology is being showcased. Lavender, the gospel, underpinned by Google Images, are all being marketed to potentially bad actors around the world. They could be coming soon to a war zone near you. An important aspect to keep in mind because oftentimes you know, tech companies that are particularly involved in supplying the kinds of systems 
that Israeli security forces and the Ministry of Defense use actually gain a net benefit out of being associated with the kinds of scalable warfare uh, that we see happening in, in Gaza because it drives their value up from a point of view of military effectiveness. So now the next government that is seeking to exact the same kinds of warfare will look to these companies as well, right? The misuse of technology, the AI system, and everything that has been weaponized in this ongoing genocide bring us to a big question about how we should today join forces with other countries and with other progressive people to ask for global regulation for uh, the use of technologies and AI. This should bring us to the question of the decolonization of technology because regulations are lagging behind that led to this technology to be misused in war times. And as those AI systems are evolving, they are just used to increase the oppression of the already oppressed people in global majority countries. This past week at the International Court of Justice, Nicaragua accused Germany of facilitating genocide in Gaza. And that has not gone down well with either the German government or the news media there. Minakshi Ravi is here with the details. The ICJ is already adjudicating two lawsuits against Israel over its assault on Gaza. But the case brought by Nicaragua is the first to put one of Israel's allies in the dock. It centers on Germany's role as a primary supplier of weaponry to Israel. Germany is failing to honor its own obligation to prevent genocide or to ensure respect of international humanitarian law. Only the United States sends more military equipment to Israel than Germany. But as Washington does not recognize the ICJ's jurisdiction, a case against the U.S. is considered unviable. Nicaragua has argued that Germany's decision to keep its weapon supplies flowing after an earlier ICJ ruling that Israel is plausibly committing genocide makes it complicit. That would be a grave accusation for any state, but nowhere does it cut quite as deep as in Germany, given its responsibility for the deadliest genocide of all, the World War II Holocaust, but also the genocides early in the 20th century of the Herero and Nama peoples in what is now Namibia. German sensitivity was on display in how many in the media there decided to respond to the ICJ case. I find it seltsam, ehrlicherweise, that the court diesen Fall überhaupt annimmt, äh, die Anklage Deutschlands. Denn im Grunde ist ja dann äh, der Vorwurf, dass Deutschland Beihilfe zum Völkermord leistet. Und das ist unglaublich. Other media outlets dismissed the allegations on account of Nicaragua's own poor human rights record. Ich glaube, wenn es eine Showveranstaltung ist, so wie Nicaragua offenkundig eine abziehen möchte, muss man das nicht ernst nehmen. The timing of the ICJ case was interesting. The day before the hearings began was the 30th anniversary of the Rwandan genocide, in which more than 800,000 people from the Tutsi ethnic group were killed. In a tweet, the German foreign ministry said the fate of the Tutsis is a constant reminder for us to never again look away. One day later, Germany was being accused at the world's highest court of doing far worse than that. Thanks, Mila. Ukraine is now into the third year of its war with Russia, and Ukrainian journalists are feeling the pressure. Investigative reporters whose work is critical of either the authorities or military leaders are getting smeared online. Masked men have come knocking on their door. The authorities in Kiev were fine with the investigative news outlet Bihus.info when it was exposing Russian war crimes. But revealing cases of corruption in Ukraine has resulted in journalists there being placed under Soviet-style surveillance by the security services. We contacted President Volodymyr Zelensky's office asking what, if anything, the government is doing to protect reporters. No reply. The Listening Post's Johanna Hus now on the ongoing attacks on journalism in Ukraine. This is the kind of journalism Ukrainian reporters at investigative outlet Bihus Info do. They keep a close eye on the country's rich and powerful. However, last December, the journalists were the ones being watched. The team had gathered in a hotel for a training workshop and became the targets of a major surveillance operation conducted by Ukraine's intelligence services. 
It was only when a little-known YouTube channel posted video and audio recordings in January that the journalist realized what had happened. The material suggested they'd been using illegal drugs and questioned whether they could be trusted. Підо неприємно. Так. Але давайте відверто. Якщо воно і несе чомусь загрозу, то хіба що здоров'ю учасників, аж ніяк не українській державності. The incident prompted Bihus to launch its own investigation into how and why the surveillance was carried out. Вони все зробили. They've done everything out in the open leaving an incredible amount of evidence on the hotel's CCTV. Overall, there were 30 people involved in this operation. Before we arrived, they came to install their gadgets, rented the cottages, installed surveillance, even in the sauna. Yo! Так точно! A week later, they came back to remove it all. So it was a massive operation by the security services. It's not that we are surprised by the surveillance or pressure. We keep an eye on the authorities, they keep an eye on us. But when the special services deploy a huge amount of resources to monitor a team of journalists at a time when we are at a full-scale war, that feels like intimidation. It wasn't just surveillance. Based on the phone conversations, we know they also wiretapped us for more than a year. The story triggered an uproar within the journalistic community in Ukraine. But the targeting of Bihus wasn't an isolated event. Other journalists have been harassed both on and offline. The editors of national newspapers and online publications issued a joint statement and even met with ambassadors of G7 countries, asking the diplomats to pressure President Zelensky to denounce the attacks. Zelensky fired the chief of the intelligence department responsible for the surveillance of Bihus. A government investigation is underway, but the story exposed deep tensions between the president and the Ukrainian fourth estate. When the war started, there was an unspoken agreement among journalists to not criticize the Ukrainian authorities. All of the anti-corruption investigations stopped, but eventually we realized that people want to hear the truth about whether someone is profiteering from the war, if corruption is taking place, if authorities are making competent decisions. Ukrainians demand diverse sources of information. That is why opposition media such as Bihus.info and independent media are mega popular, and at times more popular than the media outlets that the government had authorized. There is competition on Telegram too, and the government is trying to create a space on Telegram that works for them. But we also see how certain anonymous Telegram channels are used to discredit journalists and members of civil society. We're being cast as enemies of the Ukrainian people. We're called Russian agents. That's very dangerous, because we hold a pro-Ukraine position, but also believe the government needs to be held accountable. There's little transparency, but it's clear that all of this is happening to those who criticize the government or military leadership. We see that the authorities react quite nervously to criticism and some actions of journalists. Despite the many restrictions all journalists in Ukraine face, investigative outlets are now tackling uncomfortable topics like corruption, mobilization and troop losses on the battlefield. But these stories remain largely outside the mainstream news agenda. This is the United News TV Marathon, a rolling news bulletin that is comprised of six national channels that came together at the start of Russia's invasion in 2022. Now, two years later, those channels are still broadcasting the exact same thing, churning out messages that come with the government's seal of approval. The United Marathon was a response to the invasion when none of the channels had the capacity to provide 24-7 news broadcasting. It was necessary to very quickly find a format that would provide a verified source of information with minimal opportunity for Russia to interfere. 
It's becoming more of a PR exercise for the authorities, a tool to calm society and shield people from the real state of things. There's a place for state propaganda during the war, but there also needs to be a balance. Only one channel, Suspilna TV, gives some voice to the opposition. Otherwise, the marathon is almost void of opposing views. And it's obvious that some inconvenient topics were censored. Many journalists have questioned the format, editorial policy and government's expenditure on the United News TV marathon. An investigation by Behus published in March dug into the ownership structure and funding of the company producing content shown on TV Marathon. One of the TV channels that has a six-hour broadcast slot on United News is the State Parliament TV channel. It does not produce its own content, but pays a private production company a significant amount of state funds. Our assumption is that this company is close to the president's entourage. But you could ask, why is it important to talk about this production house at all? Well, it's because they produce content that Ukrainians watch around the clock. I'm absolutely confident that those in power would like to totally dominate the media space, replace all TV output with the marathon, and spread their message all over the internet. They're trying, but I doubt that they can achieve the result they desire. Ukrainian media can't be controlled. We have a backbone and can think for ourselves. In recent weeks, President Zelensky has toughened his stance on anonymous social media trolls, many of whom have gone after journalists. He has pushed for more regulation and transparency. In February, when Zelensky held a press conference, his tone towards journalists was more conciliatory. But with the ongoing threat from Russia and dwindling aid and media attention from the West, Ukraine's government is keenly aware that inconvenient stories about corruption and scandals may hinder their cause. Ukraine's investigative journalists say the task of keeping the country's image spotless cannot happen at the cost of transparency and the truth. We're not enemies of the Ukrainian authorities. We're partners. But we're also demanding partners, and we have a mission. We're careful with our criticism and voice it only when it is impossible to stay quiet, when our society, our victory, our democratic development is under threat. Investigative journalism is not about digging dirt. It's about making the case for something to change. We want everyone involved in this surveillance scandal to be brought to justice so it wouldn't happen again. Democratic Ukraine should not live like this because we're not Russia. Like Ukraine, another conflict that's been knocked out of the headlines by the story in Gaza is the civil war in Sudan. The country's been torn apart for a year now by a power struggle between the Sudanese armed forces and a rival militia group. The sheer scale of the humanitarian crisis is what stands out here. Roughly 8 million people have been displaced, 6 million internally, the other 2 million to neighboring countries. An estimated 18 million are going hungry. This coming week, an emergency humanitarian conference will be held in Paris. Its mission, to try to raise $2.7 billion to make up for the shortfall in food. This conflict deserves far more attention than it's been getting from the global news media, and that includes us here at The Listening Post. We'll see you next time.